news and sports and feature photography, but I, I really love shooting portraits. And even when I was doing a lot of sports action, as much fun as it is being sideline at the uh, at a Super Bowl, and believe me, it is. I, what I really loved doing was having an hour with the athletes one on one, where I was really shooting something unique unique and we were connecting so i as i realized that's what i wanted to to do more of magazines kind of seemed the the route and um uh, uh, in the one one absolute complete abuse of winning a pulitzer um i was able to parlay um the trip up to New York to pick one up and to uh, getting in the door to see a lot of magazines, which was <laughs> kind of, kind of the, the, the one time you can get by with using the line, hey, I'm in town to pick up a Pulitzer, can I stop in with my book? So uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> sort of like being related to somebody really famous. It um, gets, gets you in the door the first time, um, but then you have to deliver the goods after that. But that, that was my way into magazines. And uh, you know, really like the last six, seven years that I was working in newspapers, I was shooting magazines on the side and it was kind of the best of both worlds where, you know, I'd go off for the Miami Herald to cover turmoil in Haiti and fly back on and on weekends or vacation time shoot for Rolling Stone or Sports Illustrated. So, um, you know, it was it was a good chance to do everything that I love to do. And, and at what point when you started doing the portraiture, did you start using the the big lights and the soft boxes and the, the beauty dishes. Was that something that you kind of learned on your own? It was kind of gradual step, um, a step up. Um, the second newspaper that I worked for out of college was the Orange County Register. And uh, virtually everything we shot was in color. And unlike shooting for National Geographic, you can't wait for the light to be beautiful uh, to shoot your photographs if you've got a if you got a portrait shoot at high noon, you've got to make it look good. So way back then shooting, shooting with, uh, you know, sort of the entry, entry drug into strobe photography, the, uh, the gateway drug, the uh, Norman 200 Bs, if any of you <laughs> still remember those things, um, battery powered strobes that we set up everywhere. And it was kind of a, a evolution from that to the bigger, bigger packs to the pro photo that I'm using today, but really a lot of the, a lot of the fundamentals are the same. They just were not quite as heavy back then. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, I like the, the title of this slide because I guess uh, even when you're taking a, a portrait, you are essentially trying to tell a story in one frame or two frames of that, that person. Um, yeah, it's what kind of have a bunch of ideas of how to approach that. Yeah, I, I mean, really going back to the, the roots, I'm no longer by any stretch of a photojournalist, but even as a even as a portrait photographer, one of the things you really need to do is pay attention to what's going on um, and make a connection with your subjects. That kind of goes back to what I was saying in terms of why I liked making the move to magazine portraiture from from news photography is I liked making that connection instead of standing back and, and being a fly on the wall and not getting involved. I liked the involvement. So, you know, one of the, one of the first things I really needed to do is you know, learn how to approach people and uh, uh, make them comfortable. Um, and th that's really what I do to this day. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's someone on the street or a famous celebrity, it's, you know, you have that opportunity to find out something about their life. So these photos that we're going to look at here are kind of interesting in that these are obviously not movie stars. These are people from a, a trip, presumably to India, that you took. Um, yeah, this is Kathmandu. They they actually could be they could be movie stars in the future. We'll have to see if uh, <laughs> if uh, <laughs> what happens for them. But I I think kind of back to the last slide, one of the things is really you want to treat everybody as though they're a star. I, I love when I'm going on vacation, connecting with, with different people. And these are the holy men of Kathmandu. So um, when I, when I travel, of, of course I shoot scenics when I see stuff, but what I really, really love doing is, is doing portraits when I'm on the road. And it's a, I, I think it's a great way to kind of hone your skills and go off and shoot 
shoot what you love to shoot. When when you're in a situation like this and and you haven't been assigned this and you're in a foreign country and and the subject may or may not speak English or you may or may not speak their language, what's sort of the the process of approaching these people and saying, "Hey, uh, you know, I'm a photographer because you know since everyone's a photographer." you know what how do you differentiate yourself are you showing them your work to sort of make it legitimate or um m mostly i just smile a whole lot um <laughs> I, <laughs> I i do find that um e even in a lot of foreign lands uh, people speak more english than you would think but more than anything i kind of smile motion to the camera and and you know the the wonderful thing today is this is no longer a case of you know I want to take a photograph of you and when I get home I'm going to develop this and I'll look at it and it'll be really amazing and you know I'll, I'll be sure to drop some in the mail. The the great thing today is on the LCD on the back of your camera it's you know as you're shooting something you're showing somebody what photographs of them so they kind of become a part of the whole process. Um, we always get the question which is when you're walking on the street and you're taking pictures of people are you are you trying to get model releases at the time or you really see this as kind of a, your personal project, uh, more of like an art project than anything else? Yeah, you know, if I was really smart, I probably would be. Uh, but for the most part, I'm really not looking to put these people in a Microsoft ad. They're kind right. of personal, personal photographs and use them for lectures and things like this. But, um, you know, I'm... I'm not looking to release a, a lot of stock in most of these instances. It's just a case of going off and um, you know coming back with with wonderful memories of the trip. Um, going to Nepal to capture the holy men is one thing, but but you're kind of forced to look at any location that you're assigned to shoot in, and how do you find compelling scenery or background in anything that you're looking at? Well, I, I think ideally you get there early to scout. Um, you know, on some of the bigger, bigger budget shoots, um, certainly anything for Vanity Fair, there's a there's a budget to send out a location scout in advance. But it's actually something I really love doing myself because lo location scouts are are really really good at what they're doing, but they rarely get calls to you know check the alleyway behind the location because most people don't think to shoot there. And to me, I could be just as likely doing a, a portrait shoot behind a building, um, sort of in the, the catacombs of a, of a sports arena as I would in the middle of where you would expect. So I, I try to get there as early as possible. Sometimes that means um, I fly in the day before and scout the location to figure out where we're going to shoot. Other times that really isn't possible. You're, you know, told you can get there an hour too early and you shoot and try to find the best best thing. Um, there there are situations where I know a week in advance and I've got X amount of time like shoot wherever you want but you got an hour to do it and you kind of have to work in terms of what whatever travel time you do comes out of your shoot time but a lot of times it's worth if you've got an hour it's it's worth moving your subject 15 minutes to a better location and shooting a good picture for half an hour than shooting endlessly in a boring spot for a full 60 minutes. And what percentage of the time do you get to control kind of, you know, the golden hour shooting with the nice light versus, okay, it's midday, this is when he's free? Yeah, um, pretty much I would say almost, well, never. Um, <laughs> I wish it was more often. I, I can't tell you the number of times the, the subject um, assistant or publicist or um, manager and, and I are speaking and it's sort of well when would you like to do the shoot it's like could we shoot really really early or really really late in the day and they're like I've got 1130 to 1230 open so it's like well gee um, neat 1130 is not really that early and 1230 is really not that late so yeah uh, it, it really comes back to those days in newspapers where it's just learning to learning to make it look great, even if the light doesn't. That you're what you're handed. 
Um, so we have some images here of Richard Branson, who is one of the world's most wealthiest men and one of the world's probably more eccentric characters. Um, and all I love course. these. Yeah, yeah, no, he's totally cool, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, th this from an absolute dream shoot for Time Magazine, where really my whole pitch on this thing from the photo editor at Time was um, Richard Branson in a spacesuit on his private island. You know, I mean, really, as a pitch goes, you can't, you know, you really can't top that. That's obviously a pretty great thing. But on top of it, Richard is just a wonderful subject who, who, himself recognizes what's a great pitch and goes along with it. So these were a couple of pictures that we actually did very early in the morning on, believe it or not, this is Christmas Eve morning on his uh, private island, Necker Island in the Caribbean. And uh, this was a Time Magazine story on Virgin Galactic space flights. So he agreed to wear this space suit that we got from a prop house in LA. In LA, I think this was from Apollo 13 or something like that. I wow, I'm not positive which movie this is from, but that's that's how you get a spacesuit before one exists is you go to Hollywood. <laughs> so what, was there a, there was a, a discussion beforehand that hey, why don't you put this on, or did you show up and say we have this spacesuit for you? That's you know that's kind of a good one to discuss beforehand because that can be a big um, that can be a big oops if you don't. Um, as I said, R Richard really is truly fantastic, and he heard the pitch, and um, he loved the idea. So we, we'd already kind of signed off on that, and believe me, getting the spacesuit down there was, was that was by far the star of the shoot in, in terms of logistics. Richard, Richard and I were sort of background players compared to the spacesuit. Um, mm -hmm. It does take a lot to get a space suit, particularly a big space helmet, um, down to the middle of the Caribbean, but um, he's he's signed off on it. I you know again go in the day before to, to scout locations and uh, make the plan, and we just shot as much as we possibly could. The uh, picture on the left I kind of like because this is the the rocks near his his boat dock that we took off from, and as I was scouting it, I was just kind of thinking it sort of looks like Mars, so he could kind of be the first astronaut on Mars, but. Right. Um, obviously, the atmosphere there is very good. You don't need a space helmet. <laughs> and and in terms of these locations, were did you have them for several hours so you were able to move around, or or is the beach photo pretty close to this little rock outcrop? They're they're pretty they're actually pretty close. Um, Richard was absolutely cool and and would have given us you know gave us all the time we wanted. I was kind of conscious of the fact that that spacesuit even in December in the Caribbean is pretty bloody hot so we gave yeah. him a break which is one of the reasons we did the shots in jeans too along with our with our main shots is just kind of I always think about your subject and and keep them comfortable that's important um, so this is one example where you get to go to a private island in the Caribbean and that's all nice um, this next photo though is you know underneath a highway um, and you still made a great photo out of it. Yeah, this goes back to what we were talking about a couple of minutes ago in terms of knowing what you can do in the time you've got. So this is this is a portrait of Darius Rice uh, for ESPN the magazine, and this was an instance where I knew I would have exactly an hour with him. And uh, it, you know, again, I could have shot on campus, and it would would have been you know he probably would have been bored shooting in his gym after 15 minutes anyway. So I would have lost them, but uh, kind of had in the back of my mind this location of a basketball court underneath a freeway overpass that was about 20 minutes from campus. So you know, did the math and figured it would take him 40 minutes round trip, and I'd have 20 minutes to do this and and the tight portraits. And it actually totally paid off because he showed up, and this is the first shot we did, and he loved it, and we ended up probably getting 45 minutes with him so I didn't I didn't really lose any time in transit anyway um, and and when you saw when you scouted out this location I guess you had it in your mind that there would be some big softbox illuminating him as as well as some something illuminate the uh, the backboard in the background there yeah usually I kind of try to think through how I'm gonna how I'm gonna light things um, what the lights gonna be like at the time uh, it's it's generally best if you can scout 
close to the time of day that you're shooting. And I think that's, I think we were fairly close. So I knew that it was going to be pure shadow underneath. And then actually the, the lighting is two different, two different hard lights, just uh, basic um, pro photos, magnum reflector, which is like a 12 inch um, reflector, just a uh, one hard light lighting him from the left and then a second one just out of the frame to the right um, with a grid on it aimed up at the up at the basket. Um, um, you know, that's just sort of a personal choice that I wanted the the basket to, to read in the background. I didn't want it just to be a silhouette. So right. I, I knew I had to light that as well. So this is a good point since we have this this kind of blue sky and we have this really orange outfit to sort of talk about color fidelity and, and where that fits into your workflow. How, how do you maintain consistency across, you know, different camera bodies and different shoots and uh, et cetera? Well, I, th I think the important thing is to always kind of have a, have a base to work with. Um, even though I'm ultimately very rarely going with, you know, standard pure um, 6,000, 6,000 daylight, it's, being able to, to neutralize stuff and then decide what look you want to give it is, is a great step. So whenever I'm shooting in different lighting situations, um, I'll, I'll shoot a test with my color checker passport, which gives me not only a, a gray strip to calibrate from, but you also get all the color patches and stuff. So you can, if you, if you so choose, you can create a, a custom profile for that that particular light and lens and modifier, um, because I shoot with, I shoot with the, the same Profoto lights almost all the time. I, I have kind of, you know, can profiles for the, um, the zoom and Magnum reflectors, a different one for the white beauty dish, a separate one for the silver beauty dish. And then I'll have, uh, profiles for the, uh, Octobanks with and without the, uh, diffusion in front. Um, but if you want to get really, really specific, you just at the start, at the end of the, the shoot, when you get the lighting the way you want, you shoot a, a picture of that profile. And then that once you're back in the studio, gives you the opportunity to you know, completely neutralize the color and then from there decide if you want to make it a little bit warmer or colder. Um, typic typically, most of the color adjustments I do are toward warm and cool. Very rarely am I trying to add green or magenta to a shoot. So that's mm -hmm. really the value of having color calibration is it um, will give you that that neutral look right at the very start. And is it fair to say that you are not kind of a heavy retoucher of, of the images? I mean, things look real. They don't have this kind of painterly effect to them. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty light-handed. I think some of the things people think that I do in post were actually done in the scene. For instance, this, you know, the way of getting that blue sky really, really dark is the fact that it was, you know, the entire scene was underexposed and then the strobe opened up um, the, uh, the the basketball player in the hoop. Um, if I'd opened up for that, trying to bring that blue back is, you know, then it becomes a, a big chore. But, you know, sometimes in you can save yourself a lot of post work by, you know, just thinking in advance and getting it right to begin with. That's such a, an old school mentality to get right in the camera, Brian. Well, I'm old school, you know, Alan. <laughs> so this looks like another kind of middle of the day, but you, you underexpose the background and, and expose him properly. Exactly. So, so this, this portrait of, Jeff Gordon is shot out in um, Homestead Racetrack in, in Florida. And we were, you know, sort of, sort of mid morning. This is probably that 11 AM in, in Florida where, you know, the, the light is not as soft as it could be, um, but the clouds are beautiful. So um, in addition to the daylight striking him, the actual main light is a big octobank off to the right side of the frame, illuminating, illuminating him, but also kind of backlighting that uh, racing flag in the foreground. Um, sometimes people look at this and it's like, how many lights? And it's one, you know, it's kind of, you know, the flag's closer, so it becomes backlit, where, whereas he's kind of sidelit. And, uh, 
you know, then you know, the, the other thing, just sort of paying attention on the shot to what, what is going on in the scene, kind of going back to those days of photojournalism where you notice what's, what's happening. I'm creating this entire thing, but I notice as we're shooting that his ties kind of flapping around in the, the wind and I love the way that it looks. So I had the, I had the stylist pin his tie in position. So <laughs> suddenly it's, it's flapping in the breeze constantly. And then it's not a case of trying to wait for that moment where the tie is just perfect. It's, I'm completely concentrating on Jeff and his expressions. When, when we looked at the, uh, at the start, um, and we were looking at the Nepalese holy men and you said, you know, you often have an opportunity nowadays with digital to show them the images you're moving along. How often when you're dealing with celebrities, are you actually showing them images as you're shooting? It kind of, it kind of varies. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer, pretty much the, the monitor and, uh, um, tech doesn't really come out unless we've got our directors on the shoot and everybody needs to see it and it just slows things down. It's yeah. so much easier a lot of times where where you're just shooting sort of like the good old days of film where you go through a roll and then you stop and pause a little bit. And if you see something, you know, once you hit something you really like, a lot of times I'll show the subjects, so, you know, just to kind of get them give them an idea what the shot looks like. Sometimes this gives them a good idea in terms of they weren't expecting to see, you know, this much background in this. So it's, it's a good way to kind of get people on your side. I just don't like it when it becomes the thing where that's really all you're doing and you've got 15 people clustered over a, over monitor. Right. Right. Um, seeing the world from a new perspective, uh, Obviously, the first point is, is is key. The vantage point can have a huge impact on your photos. How how do you approach you know this idea that you need the safe photo? How much experimentation are you trying to do after you get the safe photo? Uh, as as much as I possibly can with the time that I've got. Um, you, you know, I could I could have anything from five minutes to an hour with most of the people that I shoot, and a lot of times with the it it tends to be with the when you've got an hour with somebody your direction is just do whatever you want. Whereas when you've got five minutes, they're expecting three situations in that five minutes. So there's, there's very little experimentation at that point, but very often I'll come in with kind of a plan of what I want to do. But if the subject takes me in a different direction, I roll with it. And I, I think some of my favorite pictures have happened because I've, you know, gone in with a plan and then thrown the plan out the window when the subject had a better idea. When you're getting a brief from a photo editor on an editorial job, for example, how specific are they in terms of what they're trying to capture? It really, really, really varies. Like the, the ideal thing that all of us love to hear um, is just do your thing. Like, you know, we want a portrait, <laughs> do, do your thing. And, and that actually comes along. That's, that's kind of the, the perfect scenario and uh, it gives you the freedom of sort of like, you know, I, I guess in a way it puts the pressure on you. Like, you know, you can do anything you want, so don't screw it up. But I, I always love that because that gives me the idea that I'm hired to do what I love to do. Um, on other situations, particularly covers, it's really broken down in ter terms of sometimes nothing other than we need we need the subject on the right so the text can go on the left and make sure you room for leave room for our logo at the top. And mm -hmm. it's kind of, you've got this parameter in terms of know where you've got. Um, and, you know, then sometimes I'll, I'll uncover shoots. I, I may even get a, uh, as a, a sketch as a starting point. So I've kind of got an idea. Um, and then finally there's other shoots that will literally be a, a shopping cart list of, all the, the shots you've got to do in the, in whatever time you've got. So you're kind of cranking through all those things and hoping that at the end you can carve out enough shot, uh, enough time to do something you, you really want to do. And, you know, this last point here in regards to varying options and you might sell more images, uh, is this the case where they're hiring you to say, shoot a cover and, but they say, Hey, we like these, these, other images as well, we'll use them inside of the magazine and here's more money, or is it they're coming back to you later on and saying, hey, we like some of those outtakes? Well, at the very start, it's like whenever you go out and do a shoot, 
almost every almost every editor is expecting three or four options out of that shoot. I, I mean, I've literally had the phone call before when when I had absolutely no time with the subject, and we did one setup. I've I've gotten the phone call. You know, we love the photograph. It's absolutely perfect. Where's the rest of the stuff? You know, they just it doesn't matter what happens. They are going to expect multiple options. Um, right. Sometimes it's as simple. Sometimes it's as simple as having another shot for the jump of the story. Sometimes you want to give them a picture for table of contents, and and other times, who knows? It's like an image could be slated for a tiny picture inside, and and you end up with enough great images that even the story wasn't going to be a lead story. But I have had times that because they love the photographs, it elevated to a big feature or sometimes even landed a cover for something that originally was slated as a, as a, a quarter page uh, department shot. So you, you always want to come away with the, the most variety you possibly can. This is a kind of a lower vantage point of, of Gene Hackman talking about getting the right vantage point, new perspective. Yeah, and this is also an example of what we're just talking about. This was a this was from a cover shoot of Cigar Aficionado, and you kind of have to start off the day knowing that they want uh, a tight portrait of a face for their cover. So we did we did quite a few of those images pretty pretty quickly. Did a couple changes, a couple different backgrounds. Shot shot him both against canvas and then also on. Um, on location with like a blue pool water behind it, but I had seen this really funky, you know, oversized chess set at the hotel where he was staying, and just thought, you know, that that's really cool and that's kind of different. So, you know, let me make sure that I work that shot in. So this is shot from a, a very very low angle to make the the chess pieces in the foreground see, seem even more exaggerated, and you know, he had. He had fun with it. Um, Gene's actually got a, a marvelous sense of humor, and he thought it was—he uh, he thought the perspective was pretty cool and it was fun. And this ended up being the uh, the opening shot for the article. So it's that it's that extra thing that they don't ask for that you look look for. What's what's your typical uh, uh, crew for a shoot like this? Is there a, a stylist and a makeup person and a lighting assistant? Um, it, it really varies depending on budget. For for this, the budget was pretty decent, so we had we had a, a stylist and a groomer for him. Uh, typically, for for men, uh, a groomer can handle both, you know, hair and and you know very light makeup. A lot of times, it's re you know really powder or just making everything look good. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a, a stylist with with um, wardrobe. We used I think we used some of his and then stuff we we brought as well. Um, and then um, I honestly do not remember if I had one or two assistants on the shoot. Might have been two. It's it, it used to be almost a given on cover shoots that you would always have a budget for at least two to three assistants. And now, you know, more and more magazines are, are tightening the belt. So it's, you know, can you get by with one? And typically, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm never afraid to, to pick up a pack on my own. So if if it comes down to that, I'd I'd rather make sure that I've got the the stylist and groomer than, um, you know, than keeping myself from from being there, helping right. the assistant move lights. Um, I always refer to this guy as the guy from American Pie because I can never remember his name. Ah, I think that's Jason the guy from American Pie. J Jason uh, Biggs. Um, Biggs. Um, Dates, Jason Biggs, Biggs something yes. like that. Biggs. Yes, Jason Biggs. Um, yeah, <laughs> Jason. Jason was really, really a lot of fun, and this was a this was a portrait for a beer magazine that I shoot for a lot, um, Draft, and um, um, kind of did. We did our location scouting um, via via Google, uh, finding this kind of funky funky bar with a lot of character because I thought it'd be fun. I thought it'd be fun for him. Um, our models. Um, the, the nearest butt hovering right over him is our art director Kevin Robbie, um, you know, doing doing his part for our shoot. And then the the other two models on the far end cost us a grand total of one beer apiece. So <laughs> yes, you 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 still can find excellent talent in Los Angeles at a at a good price. Um, and then uh, Jason had a had a 
big laugh out of this whole shoot. I think it was, it had something to do with seeing someone lower themselves to the level of an American Pie actor or something. Right. Like that. So, right. So was this was this a, a, the safe shot, or was this something you you walked in and you said, "I like that quilted padding on the side of the bar. Let's get Jason down there for a different perspective." Well, we shoot we. You know, at the time we did about two years of their covers and, and interior shots. So it's kind of anything I can do to give a shot a different twist instead of, you know, one more shot of the guy sitting sitting at a, at a bar or um, cocktail table. So I'm, I'm always looking for something funky. And yeah, the, you know, kind of quilted aqua, um, wonderful original Naga hide fabric just caught my eye. <laughs> And, you know, when you walk into a situation, I know you were looking for kind of a funky bar, um, but having shot so many portraits, do you ever panic about what you're going to do on the next portrait to be original or something? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's like sometimes you come into these things, and I mean, that, that's probably one of the reasons that I kind of look for these funky or weird locations, because it's, you know, I if if you're in a real generic office setting sort of thing it's like it can tend to look like the same hallway after the same hallway after the same hallway so i'm i'm kind of always drawn to things a little bit more more unusual but you know that panic is not it's nothing to be afraid of that's just you know creativity screaming in the back of your head and trying to get get out um, for the outdoor shots that we've seen, the Darius Rice, even the Gene Hackman, how how often are you going out and, and, and getting location permits to do these these shoots? Um, pretty much never. Pretty much never permits. We we do get we do get permission from the location. For Gene, it was a piece of cake because he was staying there, and that's kind of the one trick. Whenever you're photographing celebrities, uh, if you are if you want to photograph them at the hotel where they're they're staying, the the hotels are almost always absolutely delighted because they know that some part of their location will end up with a famous celebrity in a magazine. So mm -hmm. that's that's about the easiest thing to do. I think with um, I think with now with Darius, um, I did I did pull a permit because we were on um, at a city park. Uh, so I just pulled it with the the I think it was city of Miami or something like that. So mm -hmm. you pretty much want to figure out if, if, if there's a decent chance that a cop's going to drive by in the, the time that you're shooting, you, you got to have a permit. Um, so we have a, a, a few questions and I, I think they're commenting on sort of the vibrance of the color here, but a lot of people are asking whether you use HDR, high dynamic range photography. Um, I, I do not use HDR at, at all. Um, this particular one that we've got right here is is probably, um, I, I guess it might be what you call faux HDR, which, you know, which in Lightroom is is just kind of, you know, opening up the shadow values a, a, a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. If you go too far, it kind of looks like really really bad bad HDR. But instead, um, you know, here's kind of an instance that that I wanted, you know, a little bit more of the detail in the blacks to to open up. So I, I probably pumped in about um, 20, 20 points on that just to open it up a bit. Yeah. Uh, typically, typically though, I'm going more the other extreme where I'm embracing the shadows instead of trying to open them up. Gotcha. Pose, gesture, and emotion. Um, I shoot a lot against seamless when I try to be a portrait photographer. And I think capturing people against white seamless versus sort of an environmental portrait is so difficult. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely more to, to me, I have to agree. It's a lot more difficult where that's one of the things that if it really is an opportunity to pick a background that, that says somebody think about the person, it just gives you so much to play with. Um, when, you know, when you are working against a solid background, um, the, the upside, though, to look at it is, is a, along with the difficulty that you, you you mentioned, the other trade off that you've got is is suddenly you've got a chance to really, really put the person center stage and make this 
really about their expression and the interaction that you bring out. So, you know, you're you're no longer worried about what's going on in the background, what's going to pop up here or there, or you know how to do the light the next shot. You're pretty much set to go, and it really just is on making that connection with your subject and bringing out some emotion. You know, when you're when you're photographing someone, and and obviously everyone has different shaped faces and features and some people are very thin and some people are, have a little extra weight you know are you very conscious as you're shooting to say this person has to jut their chin out to remove the double chin or I need to be a little bit higher on an angle or is it very natural for you at this point? I, I think that's one of those things it's that almost you you want to get to the point where you, where you know all of those techniques but can forget about them like you you need to understand all the things that you can do, but they need to be so second nature to you that you know you're not stopping to delay and 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 think about it. You're just doing it. So um, you know, a, a lot of times on the the shoots, some people look good no matter what you do with the lighting. Other other times, it's you're kind of crafting it a little bit to make the light the lives look look the best. And yeah. then you know, okay, so he, we jumped over here to to one of my favorite pictures of. Uh, uh, Richard Schiff and Peter Gallagher. Um, that really is a hundred percent emotion. It's um, you know I did an entire book, Art and Soul, where the lighting probably didn't change more than you know you know six inches one way or the other. We we always kept the light from the same side and and a fill. So it really was not about the light. Same background on everything, but it gave us the opportunity to concentrate on on emotion and and one of the things that you also want to do is you want to make the entire shoot experience fun for your subject and it's like when you think about it people a lot of people really dread being photographed so anything that you can make it do to make it oh i don't know maybe a little less horrible is a good thing so um, <laughs> um we had we had photographed richard in in la for the book Art and Soul, and he was having so much fun that when everybody else came in, he posed with him. And I realized Richard pretty much knows everybody in Hollywood because, like, the next guy in was Dulé Hill, who he was in West Wing with, and everybody seems to know Richard. And then, you know, at one point he says, um, "You know, this is really fun. Do you mind if I call? I was golfing with somebody this morning. Do you might mind if I call him in?" And I was like, sort of like, "Sure, Richard. Just you know." invite your caddy while you're at it and and 15 minutes later his golfing buddy Peter Gallagher shows up so you know the, the joke was completely on me um, he's completely wired in and this is you know this is just kind of one of the shots we did right as Peter showed up so you always kind of want to watch for those things what's uh to, to appease all the, the gear questions we're getting what, what sort of camera are you using and, and, and what was the lighting kit for this for, for these images Oh sure. I mean, it's it's easy because we shot the same all the way through. This is the Sony Alpha 900. Um, their first, it was Sony's first full frame sensor camera. They have just released the A99, but these were all shot with the the A900. And um, my favorite lenses that they make, which are um, um, two of their Zeiss lenses, the the CZ um, 24 to to 70 2.8 and the 85 14 and both both of the lenses not only are like incredibly sharp but just have a really nice color fidelity to them so they're they're my favorite portrait lenses and I tend to shoot I actually tend to shoot more often with um, 70 millimeter than than 85 because a lot of times for the the tight portraits I love being just a little bit closer to the subject than Kind of the traditional 85, 100, 135, and 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 that's a function of the the look, or you just like being physically closer to have more rapport with the subject. It, it's it's both. It's it in terms of the look, it lends the image a little bit less flattened. So the the face has a little bit of roundness to it, but not as round as you would be if you went in you know real tight with a with a normal 50 millimeter lens. So I. I just like the kind of intimate feel that it gets, but it also keeps you close where you're kind of, you know, um, having a quiet conversation with your subject instead of shouting directions from across the, the studio with the 200 millimeter lens. And 
Then in terms of lighting, uh, all these are, are lit with the, the same setup, a uh, Profoto Beauty Dish, a 22-inch 20, white round reflector with a grid on it to kind of focus it almost like a spot, and then a fill right behind camera just, just to open up the shadows a, a touch. They're such lovely, lovely portraits. Uh, I guess the question I would have is, you know, I, I've always contended, well, if you gave me a supermodel to photograph, then I could take a nice photo of a supermodel. You know, these these images have such great character. Is it easier to work with actors versus like a businessman, like a CEO guy? Well, I mean, speaking of supermodels, I mean, Bill Macy is a supermodel. I mean, we, <laughs> let's just acknowledge that right there. Yes. Um, this is, yeah, this is, this is Bill jumping over to an, another, an advocate, advocacy campaign for a, uh, WWE and the Creative Coalition, the Be a Star anti-bullying campaign, and and Bill showed up with a um, with a bandaid on his nose and was about to take it off, and he said, "No, this is probably a good thing for for anti-bullying." So it's you know he's a dream dream subject and and supermodel. Um, yes, but um, yeah, I think I think there's something in terms of I I love actors, particularly character actors, because they they play along, they play a part, comedians as well, um, and you can just really have a lot of fun with them. Um, CEOs is typically a different approach where you, you have to direct them more. It's just, it's not necessarily one is better than the other, it's just, you know, one takes more direction than the other. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know, we were talking about the, the Art and Soul book that you produced, um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about the whole notion of color calibration. We, we talked about, you know, using the, the color checker passport. Um, what sort of tools are you using on the desktop to ensure that what you're seeing on the screen is what you're getting in the book? Yeah, so that's, that's the next part in the whole equation. It's, so when you're shooting, you start off with, with a color checker, so you've got something to calibrate from. But just as important is you've got to have your, you have to have your computers calibrated to, um, you know, an industry standard. So when I'm going between uh, my MacBook Pro on the road and, um, you know, my desktop uh, at home with a with a 30 inch monitor, typically those things right out of the box, the, the color would be all over the place and. My editor, you know, if they weren't calib color calibrated, would have something totally different. So the, the idea is if everybody calibrates, then the images that I'm working on um, will match what I see in production. And, and because x rights really the industry standard, um, throughout the, the entire process of printing the book, the great, the great situation would be I would the, the images that I worked on in the um, and and handed off from from my computer the first time I saw them as proofs was up in New York and they're looking at proofs under you know neutral co neutral color balance and we're able to evaluate how it's printed close to that and everything was like with within a couple points so that's why you know unless you have the option if you're shooting if if you're shooting for a, a publication, you can actually afford to send everybody a a laptop balanced to to your specifications. Um, you've got to go with color calibration. <laughs> right. So so I use so, the uh, the one that I use the the, the most often um, since since it came out was the, is the i1 Display Pro two mm -hmm. um, because the i1 Dis Display Pro is small enough that it will fit in a bag with me and I have I've literally been on the, the road on this in fact in the middle of this project uh, had some type of operating system crash on on my Mac and had to completely reinstall the, the operating system and once you do all those wonderful profiles that you had are out the window so I'm in the middle of New York and uh, I love those computers, but they actually come out from factory default, kind of blue and too contrasty. But yeah, you know, just plug in the Display Pro, run a quick calibration, and 
now I know as I'm looking at it is back to what um, what I've calibrated in the studio and um, every, everything's going to match up and make sense you know, when I hand the files off to. And, and that i1 Display Pro, is a, it's a pretty small unit, right? So you, you just throw it in your bag while you're traveling and you can be on Absolutely. an airplane. And I mean, that's one of the good things too. It's, it's, it's small enough you never leave it behind. And that's yeah. kind of the key is, is um, it's smaller than a, a light meter. And um, I take it on the, on the road um, both, both to calibrate projection when I'm speaking, but also, you know, uh, to, to recalibrate when I, I've, you know, it's, it's time to recalibrate or, you know, if I have a system crash that gets me up right away with uh, consistent color. Um, seeing the light, uh, you use a whole bunch of different modifiers from soft boxes to magnum reflectors to, to beauty dishes. Do you sort of approach every shoot kind of knowing the quality of light that you're looking for, or is that something you kind of decide when you get to the location? Sometimes, sometimes I'll, I'll go in and I kind of have a feel for the shoot, like I know what I want to say about it. Um, and then other times it's kind of a case of like, you know, how do I make this scene look right? Um, it's kind of a, a mixture of the two, whether it's, it's, it's just the right lighting for the subject in the scene or, or if it is a mood you're trying to create. Um, and, you know, we, we saw each other in Seattle at the APA photo assistant uh, uh, seminar, and, and you talked about using strobed light kind of to make it look like it was daylight and, and being sort of directional in the same, same way as sunlight was streaming through a window. Is that something that, that you're kind of keenly aware of when you're, when you're creating a photo? Yeah, I think that's I think that's one of the big things to look at is you know at least be aware of what natural light would do. Like a lot of times, I really don't I don't want the the images to scream exactly you know that they were lit. I just want it to look like I happen to be the the lucky guy who actually got to shoot at you know eight o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning instead of shooting at noon. So <laughs> right. it should kind of take you kind of take those those keys like if you see hard sunlight streaming through a window but it's but it's going about four inches because lights almost overhead it you know if you want to replicate that you you go with a, a you know direct reflector like a like a you know hard reflector or something as opposed to um, a big softbox so kind of you know if you if you want something to look like you know daylight you work with that so here's our here's our color checker passport. Um, we were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. So you can see, which we'll just blast off a frame before we get started. And this is, uh, is this from a, the burlesque images that you, you shot? Yes, this is, this is the lovely burlesque dancer, Gal Friday. Um, we did this actually for an X-Rite um, um, video that's still floating around there on the, uh, on the web somewhere under color and burlesque. So first thing we do is kind of do color calibration, and then that's gonna that's gonna stay the same as as long as I keep the lighting the same. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things. It's like this really doesn't take that long as we move different performers in there. If I'm keeping the lighting the same, I don't have to recalibrate every time. You know, the lights will stay consistent. I, I got to tell you, I used the color checker passport this morning for a portrait shoot, and I, I don't know. There's, you know, you, you, I, I take the image into Lightroom. I, I use the white balance uh, um, eyedropper, and the subtlety that you get off of those different gray patches, it just really can neutralize the color and then bias the color. How you know how you were saying before, it, it makes such a nice difference. Yeah, and I think a, a lot of times it. One of the things it teaches you when when you see what a subtle difference is, you, you might be talking five points one way or another, and yeah. going back and forth on your own going oh, a little too magenta no a little too green now it's like you waste all this time and it's so much easier with the eyedropper just to you know to to neutralize it and then figure out what the heck you want to do uh here's a lovely image and and i think we had a question before too in regards to how often are you forcibly changing the white balance and then gelling the light so in this That's case it looks like the 
you know, the background is very, very blue? That's, that's a great question. Um, so actually in this instance, this is, this is shot at, at dusk as the sun is going down. And the sky in the background was actually gray as could be to your eye. However, as the light goes down, the, the color balance actually changes. It gets, a gray sky gets bluer as, as it gets darker and darker and you get that last little bit of daylight out there. So here's an instance, if I was using auto white balance, the, the camera would probably correct for me and make those, those gray clouds look gray just like they're supposed to, but that's not really what I want here. You know, we're just really locking down our exposure either, you know, either by calibrating or, you know, setting it at, uh, you know, if you even just set the, the color for daylight balance, you'll see this, this happens. And then, so that's the blue that you see in the background for, for lighting. This is a portrait of Alejandro Sanz. He's a, Spanish Grammy winning singer and I just wanted the light on him to kind of go the other direction. So as the background's going blue, we've got a big octobank off to the left and it's lit with, um, it's got like a, a one half tungsten conversion gel over, over the, uh, the light. So it's, you know, halfway to what would be tungsten, um, looking light and that, kind of keeps it warm on him while the background's going blue. And I think a lot of times you kind of give it these nice light sources um, where, where it's kind of the, the, the warm and cold, just like highlights and shadows working with warm and cold. And uh, the, the look that I wanted for this is, I just, I wanted this to look like that, you know, I had that wonderful last beam of sunlight hitting him of course, I couldn't do that because the sun had actually set behind the trees in the background. I just wanted it to look like, you know, the sun was setting off to the left and, you know, just kind of caught him with the last bit of daylight. And how do you convince a, a Grammy Award winner to go into a pool with his clothes on? He, you know, that, that, that was an interesting thing. They did, when we showed up for the shoot, they, they took us to a room with two gold records on the wall that he did all of his interviews and all his photos in. And, you know, it was fine, but particularly, you know, nothing really fascinating. So I just asked if I could look around and it, the house was, was great. There were all these different spots. We, you know, I, I came back to his manager and gave him a list of all the stuff I wanted to do. He said, great. So we shot him against his white grand piano. We shot him upstairs with his artwork. I shot him actually painting, um, shot him out in front and we'd done all these pictures and I kind of had in the back of my mind, you know, for the very last shot, I wanted him in the, in the pool. And uh, of course, big tip right here. Um, if you plan on getting your subject soaking wet, uh, save that for your last shot. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I also, the timing was going to be about right where I, I, you know, was also knew I was going to get this, this beautiful dusk picture. And by the time we'd done all this stuff, it's, he'd done, we'd done five pictures already that are completely different than anything he'd ever done before locations. He'd never posed. So he's having a good time. So literally I was starting to, you know, explain saying at the end of this shot, I'd love to get you in the water when I heard a splash because it was like there was like he was ready he was you know he was <laughs> so into it at this point like boom in the water there he goes so you know it's funny we we didn't waste the time on those pictures leading into it went straight for this all right this next guy's one of my favorites i mean christopher walken is so weird i just saw a, a, a movie preview with him and he's just such a funny guy um tell us about this one um, Chris is indeed um, a, a very unique talent and a absolutely spectacular face. So, you know, here's here's an instance where, uh, you know, I really don't need that much of a background around him other than this is just this is a canvas backdrop um, behind him with a with a tungsten light aimed at it, and I just want to come in tight on this face. And, you know, uh, we've had a couple comments in regards to, like, why this specific pose for this specific person? He's not looking at the camera. He's kind of looking, you know, down. Um, you have this kind of background that's on fire. Uh, was there something specific you had in mind for this? 
I think I think like in general, I think looking into the camera is kind of overrated. So it's like I do an awful lot of shots of, of people, you know, looking off. And I think a, a lot of times actors really kind of like that because it it is more a case where they can drop into character as opposed to, you know, staring at the camera and smiling, which it's like, you know, just do something different. Um, you know, but it also it also depends. Like he just had such a marvelous face for, you know, l- looking off that it seemed kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, now this next image, I know that you showed up in around noon for this yeah. shoot, but you didn't actually get to to actually <laughs> shoot them until midnight. Well, what was the, so talk yeah, about changing was, lighting. It, it, yeah, yeah. It was it was very close to that. Very close to that. Um, the um, for those of you who've never done a hip hop shoot, there's something called a call time. And the call time is the time that you're expected to show up and guaranteed that you will never, ever, 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 ever have to photograph a portrait at the call time. Um, it's sort of a, the call time is kind of a guideline for when a picture is not going to happen. And it was, it was not quite as bad as noon, but I do think it was about four o'clock. And I even questioned it because it was Vibe magazine. And it's kind of like, yeah, when, when are we really getting this? And they said, no, no, you'll, you'll get it right away. You're, you're the priority. You're the most important person. Uh, this photo is their their priority for the whole day. You're the most important thing they're doing. It's like, you, you just know you are never the most important thing when you're doing a photograph, <laughs> right. particularly when there's a video involved of of anybody. So it, we got there at 4 o'clock, and, and actually some of the cars were there, which was kind of cool. It's, it's kind of scouting around thinking. I think the production, I kept hearing from the um, the publicist that they're five minutes away, um, I think for close to three hours, and then they did finally show up. Um, started started rolling. It was getting it was getting dark, and and um, of course at that point they're really rushing to get the video in, and then this picture is shot about uh, probably a good eight hours into my day at um, a, a couple minutes after midnight. They finally. Uh, they finally wrapped the production, and it, you know, at this point, I'll, I'll be honest that um, even the director and, and DP were feeling kind of bad for me because they'd seen me standing around all day. So, they're like, wh- whatever, whatever you need, it's all yours. And I'm like, just don't turn off your lights. So this is this is a case of sort of blending strobe lights on them with all the the lights from the ambient light in the city in the background, as well as the the video lights that were there. So it's, you want to use every light that's possibly available. So you, I mean, we've seen it in, in some of the other images as well, but you, you often will drag the shutter for, you know, a second or more to get the ambient to, to kind of bleed through. Yeah. So this is, this is locked down, um, on a tripod. Um, this is, um, I do remember very clearly this was a, a one second exposure, probably around 11, um, and a, and a half or so. Um, and they, I put them in a spot that they would be pretty much in silhouette if I didn't, I didn't light them. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a clue. It's like, you don't have to worry about the guys, you know, getting too much movement out of your subject if you put them where they're not lit. And then this is the, you know, they're lit with a, a single beauty dish in the grid, just kind of, you know, aimed enough from the side where it would just look like one more light from production. And the yellow smoke off to the left there, is that just dust being kicked up? Um, yeah, that actually was, that, that was um, an instance where I got kind of a cooler shot than the video did because right. they had all this backlight going on, but it really wasn't until everybody was hightailing out of there and were kicking up all this dust that suddenly, you know, I got the cool background out of that. That's awesome. And our last image here, um, Great black and white shot, wonderful light. Yeah, this is kind of an example of, okay, so we've talked about all these things about how how you light it and how you create light. But one of the most important things to do is to recognize really, really beautiful light when it happens. So um, this portrait of a restaurant owner, Sharif Melnick, and I had, uh, you know, the entire thing set up, lit, ready to go. And then right as he arrived and as they're doing, you know, little light grooming on him, 
all of a sudden the sun comes out, pops through the glass block windows, and for about five minutes we get this beautiful light streaming through um, into the studio. So we just positioned the background and, and put him in this light, forgot, you know, at that point we forgot about all the light we set, set up and just took advantage of this. And are these V flats? I mean, they, it's not like a yeah. slate wall or anything. They're just V flats. Yeah, no, no. This is just this just foam core V flat, um, or you know, walls where you want them. Amazing, amazing. Um, so I should let everyone know uh, that Brian has just published a book called Secrets of Great Portrait Photography. I ordered my copy from Amazon and I got it last week, and it's fantastic. So there's. You know, I know a lot of people want to see more images, and all. I can assure you there are a ton of images in there. You can also get it from your website, Brian, bridesmith.com slash books. Yeah, we have all the all the, the links um, to the book right there, so that that will link you to all the different books we've got out. And tell us about all the, the, the speaking that you're doing in the next week. So you're, you're <laughs> yeah. at Photo Plus. Yeah, I, I, I sort of feel like I'm all I'm missing is the Parama Small, but um, <laughs> I, I'm I'm starting off um, next Monday the 22nd at 6 p.m. at the Apple Store Soho. Then um, Tuesday at SBA from uh, 12 to 2 o'clock for an APA advocacy talk. For those of you who want to find out about licensing your work and copyright, if you happen to be in New York City, we're doing that. And then. Um, Friday of next week from 4 to 6, I'm going to be doing um, a talk specifically on lighting, kind of based on the book Secrets of, it will be Secrets of Great Portrait Lighting at the Photo Plus Expo. And pretty much all the rest of the time during Photo Plus, I will be at the Sony booth um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whenever I'm not doing the, uh, the Expo talk. And then finally, um, on Monday the 29th at um, the b &H photo event space and then back down to Miami for a <laughs> gallery opening so <laughs> exactly so definitely if you all are in New York or coming for photo plus make sure you check out uh, any one of those Brian uh, uh, events um, we should also let you know and maybe Brenda can talk about this um, but uh, x right has some rebates for you in regards to these two products here, and we've, we've talked about them both, and I own both, so I'm super excited to actually be part of this. Brenda, go ahead, Brenda. Oh, sorry, guys. Yeah, we, uh, we're we going to send you emails that have uh, these rebate certificates attached, so if you're interested in uh, either one of these, and actually this is, this, uh, is happily incorrect because the rebate for i1 Display Pro is actually 50 bucks, so oh, oh. Uh, you'll be getting that in the next couple of days. Thanks a lot, folks. And this Color Checker Passport is not an expensive item for for what you get so you know if nothing else I really strongly encourage you guys to get to get that I should also let you know uh, about our next webinar uh, which is happening during photo plus it's with uh, Dan Milner who's the photographer in residence in, at blurb who's going to talk about uh, creating picture books and creating stories and narratives when you create your your photo book so we hope you can uh, join us for that but Brian thank you so much for joining us uh, I look forward to seeing you next week and seeing you down in Miami in a few weeks Always a pleasure, Alan. Thank you very much for having me on. And thanks to the audience for joining us today. As we mentioned before, uh, this uh, recording will be up uh, hopefully later today. I might have started it maybe two minutes late after we started. So there might be a little bit missing, but all the good stuff is there, I promise. Um, but please join us next time and uh, visit us uh, at our blog, photoshelter.com, blog.photoshelter.com, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.